Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome to our first event of spring semester. Um, I don't know, maybe I think it's a in the way. I'm Richard Gerson, I direct the Center for 21st Century Studies, and we are sponsors of the Serious Play Collaboratory, <coughs> who are sponsoring Rennes' talk today. Um, after the talk, you're all invited to join us up on the ninth floor for, yes, it's light again now at 5 o'clock, for views <coughs> and refreshments, um, both of which are, are valuable, and for further conversation. And uh, before I uh, turn this over to Stuart Mulford to introduce our speaker, I wanted, as we like to do, to acknowledge uh, the fact that we here in Milwaukee live on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes. On these lands, the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet, and the human and non-human people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We're grateful to live and work alongside all of the diverse inhabitants of this place. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> and, and I want to thank the center, uh, <clears throat> not just for sponsoring the collab, which has been so important to so many of the people in this room, um, but for the contribution the center makes to this university, and particularly to the humanities in this university, which you know is absolutely essential and unparalleled. Uh, so, Rainer Koskima is professor of contemporary cultural studies in the Department of Music, Art, and Culture Studies in the University of Yavaskala, Finland. He is deputy director, or as he says here, vice director of the Finnish Center, Finnish Center of Excellence in Game Studies a very ambitious multi-campus consortium underwritten by the Finnish Academy. And the Finnish Academy is now sort of the stuff of my dreams. <laughs> if we had any kind of academy, um, <clears throat> particularly one that's willing to lay out more than a million euros on a project. Um, I won't tell you how big the budget for this project is, because it would depress you. <laughs> Uh, but, but it makes me happy that it's going to such a nice group of people. Uh, um, the, the, the project, which involves three Finnish universities, uh, networks dozens of faculty and graduate researchers. Uh, Raina himself has been working on various aspects of contemporary culture from experimental and postmodern, postmodernist fiction, which is actually kind of how the two of us got together, uh, to um, uh, transmedia experiences, another thing that, that he has worked on. The, the, the range of Rhino's work is very, very broad. Um, and of course, video games, uh, which is actually how he and Thomas Malaby have connected. So um, it's, it's, it's a lovely network event here uh, we have going on. Um, and I, I just wanted to reflect before I shut up and turn it over to Rhino. Um, on, a, on a story that he reminded me of uh, yesterday, I think it was. So we have another friend in common, a sort of absent friend here, uh, a fellow named Espen Orsett, uh, which is not spelled the way it's pronounced. Um, <clears throat> he's thought by many to be you know, one of the originators of game studies as we know it. And in fact, we know this because in 2000, Reina in, invited Espen to come to Yavaskala and speak on the subject of digital culture. And what Espen said was, no, 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 digital culture, wrong, no, everyone will have forgotten that phrase. Uh, it's game studies, right? Uh, and and I, I think Raina and I both, because we both heard that talk from Espen, uh, we both thought, yeah, no, it's digital culture, buddy. You know, we're, we're interested in other things. Uh, and yet, Game studies keeps pulling us back. And, and it, has it, 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 it has a gravity. And it's pulled Rhina in the direction of esports. And I will now turn the floor over to him. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Uh, welcome. Um, thanks to Stuart, to Thomas, to make it happen. 
uh, especially thanks to Stuart for a great prospect of Olympia. And uh, going to talk to you about esports, as I said. Uh, first, a few words about where I come from. So, Finland, northern part of Europe. Jyväskylä, there, uh, in, in the central Finland, as we used to say. But as you can see, it's uh, absurd. It's nowhere near center, <laughs> which is more like here. <laughs> uh, but it's just, we, we tend to forget that there is the <laughs> upper half, which is uh, almost empty. There are some Sami indigenous people and Santa Claus living here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And uh, otherwise, great place, but we have awful neighbors. Uh, Sweden, <laughs> Russia, uh, whom we love to hate for good reasons. Sweden has given the world ABBA and uh, IKEA. Uh, Russia, uh, well, what can you say? Um, Russia has given the world Trump presidency, at least. <laughs> 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 so, but, uh, not going to talk politics here. Okay. So, but, uh, so that's sort of squeezed by these two, two, two neighbors. But, but we manage. We manage. We manage so well, actually, that for the two years in a row, Finland has been, since so the uh, happiest country in the world. Uh, it's very hard for us to, to really realize that, but I uh, have to believe if the statistics say so. So uh, yeah, we are happy as long as nobody is uh, kind of asking us to that sort of uh, requiring us to extreme levels of, of uh, social experience, like <laughs> watching strangers in July or getting into close contact with neighbors, <laughs> going into the same hallway at the same time, and all of that. So if you are not recording that from us, we are very very content. So that's that's for Finland, and then going to uh, esports. Okay, so uh, just a, that's sort of a working definition for uh, for esports. It's a, a competitive gaming. You can argue that all gaming is competitive to some extent, but there, uh, as I see, there has to be this some sort of institutional or organized setting or framework for the competitive uh, play for it to, to, to be considered as eSports. It doesn't have to be professional, however, so that's, a, that's a, another matter. But there are also sort of this ladder and other ranking systems, so, so everybody who is kind of taking seriously their hobby of playing can go to these uh, sites and competing against each other in these, these rankings. And uh, that's already, I would consider as that's an eSport uh, activity. There are LAN events, so, so events where people are going usually with their own machines, uh, <coughs> connecting them and playing, so they are in the, in the same kind of physical setting there. And uh, well, often these LAN, LAN events are not only about kind of competing, it, it can be creating these uh, demos or, or, uh, or sort of, kind of creating games, but, uh, but often there is also game tournaments involved. And then what people often think when they hear about esports is, is this can be professional tournaments, uh, which may take place online, totally online, or there may be a LAN that sort of event, uh, often in a, in a big venue, in a, some sort of stadium, possibly thousands of, of audience uh, as they are spectating the, the, the games. Uh, usually, even with the, with these LAN tournaments, there's the, 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 uh, the precedes so with this on, uh, online uh, qualification uh, stages. Intel Extreme Masters, ESL One, uh, the International Overwatch League. These are the, the most uh, best known uh, professional esports tournaments. Uh, no matter what level you are looking at. There are certain elements. Uh, you will have the players beat the team in Counter-Strike. You have five players in the team, opposing team. Uh, there has to be somebody casting it to the stream. 
uh, usually commenting it, uh, usually to Twitch, it can be in Facebook, in, in uh, YouTube, wherever. So kind of the, the teams or the players and the stream, streaming team, and then miles and miles of cable. <laughs> can't avoid that. So we are far from wireless game still. So these are the main elements. There may be some audience there. You can see there are a few of those here, even in this case. That was a small kind of that sort of show tournament we arranged at uh, our university a year ago. Uh, it seems it's, it's a quite recent phenomenon, maybe 10, 15 years, that we have had this uh, sort of professional esports. But uh, there has been precursors to that. Uh, if you, if you think it as, a, as a making a recording of somebody playing, uh, there, there has been a lot of that happening, at least from the uh, 1980s. This is from one, one uh, research publication, a couple of, of uh, quotations there. So uh, back in the day, in the uh, 1989, for example, people were just kind of videotaping their, their playing, and uh, that's uh, uh, close to what we see in, in game streams today. So that, that's one of the kind of that sort of prehistorical strands there. But also uh, there have been lots of televised gaming competitions since early uh, 1980s. And if you if you look at these screenshots uh, the same elements that you have in esports today. So there on the on the TV screen you have the the game itself. You have the face scan, you have the counter, uh, there was also a commentator. So there have been lots of these, uh, these tournaments. Uh, and uh, they are that sort of kind of direct precursors to the uh, esports today. And did you know that the USA had a national team in video games in the 80s already? And that competed against the, the Japanese national team in the late, late 80s. So there is a, that sort of uh, institutions already yeah, at the quite early phase. Uh, one of my PhD students is just kind of yes, handed in his thesis manuscript just a, kind of a week ago, uh, looking at this uh, uh, esports as a as a, as a yeah, spectacle, and he has been looking at this the TV gaming shows and the. Well, no need to kind of pay too, too close attention to the numbers as such, but the, the thing is that is kind of notable here is that the, the amount of gaming TV shows dropped around 2010, maybe a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. So around the time when online streaming started to, to gain speed. So it's a, it's a very clear connection here. Now that uh, Twitch and other, other online streaming services have kind of increased in popularity, the TV shows are going down. But there are still many of those. So for this eSports scene, the live streaming is uh, extremely important. Uh, there, there would not be the eSports scene as it is without live streaming. So Twitch, that's the main platform or channel. YouTube to some extent. And also some tournaments are, are kind of, uh, shown through Facebook. The casters who are making these this streams are all celebrities in their own right. Uh, and actually, the, the most kind of popular streamers or casters are, are making more money out of that than the, than the professional players. But also, the many players are, are streaming you know, whenever they have time for that uh, once that they are kind of professional play. And also, TV channels are, are providing uh, eSports content. That's a, that's a very that's a, uh, uh, challenging field. Uh, Teal Taylor has been writing about that. I have been discussing with the, with the people from uh, Finnish uh, public broadcast company who has been making this uh, eSport broadcast in television for five years. And he said that, it's, uh, that the irony of it is that, that now that I, they have learned how to produce good quality eSport, uh, <coughs> number of audience watching it in television is decreasing. Uh, and the, 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 their decision last year was that they, they went to Twitch. 
So they are making the productions to television, but they are also streaming it in Twitch because that's the way to really uh, uh, reach the audience. And then the unavoidable question of, is it sports? Uh, I, that's not really, I don't see it as an as a important question at all. I like to talk more about competitive gaming than, than esports, but, uh, but there are certain, certain reasons why it's, uh, there's some significance to this. The International Olympic Committee thinks so, uh, to the extent that they are considering taking uh, esports as part of the, of the uh, Olympic Games. Uh, well, there are, there are certain very obvious that's our challenge is there, uh, most of, importantly, that uh, Olymp the, the, the Olympic Committee has these ex exclusive media rights and sponsorships. Uh, and it's, it's very hard to, to kind of fuse that with this, uh, the, the commercial game companies who are running the esports. So it's, it's a commercial that sort of problem mainly. It, it's not a question if it's sport or not, but rather how to arrange so that everybody is happy. Uh, commercially, how it's done. So uh, it, it seems uh, obvious that, that esports is part of the Olympic Games uh, soon. Uh, but also uh, another question in, in relation to this discussion of is it sport or not is the, uh, the amount of the sort of physical exercise that goes alongside with the, with esports. And that, that's one of the things that we have been looking at our, our university in, in my team. So. Uh, uh, Veli Matti Karholahti, Tuomas Kari from Jyväskylä conducted a survey with uh, elite e athletes, so, so professional playing on the, on the highest level, asking about their physical exercise habits. So uh, altogether they are using five and a half hours in uh, uh, training and uh, kind of one hour of that per day is physical exercise. <coughs> And uh, also, so no need to go that through in detail. But it's a kind of the bottom line is that the, the e athletes are, are active in uh, traditional athletics as well. Uh, so it's a kind of there is a connection there. And uh, so that was elite professional players. We have been also looking at uh, that sort of youth who are, are just kind of hobbyists, not, not professional players, not in the esports scene as such at the moment, but at them did a summer camp, an esports training camp last summer. We made questions to them and uh, all sort of things, but it's, uh, they, they are actually exercising quite much. Uh, not feeling lonely, so much about the stereotype of this uh, social... But they're Finns. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, you know, we have to make that exact kind of true. And, also, and, and they are doing very well in school, so uh, there are the, the craze and all of that. Of course, this is a very small sample, but this is more you know, kind of pilot study. Uh, and also, they were they were kind of playing quite a lot, so it's uh, four to five hours per day. And these are kids who are going to school, so on top of that, they are playing close to five hours per day. So it's uh, yeah, quite extreme. Uh, and in addition, they are watching also streams. So uh, their their days are filled with, with, with gaming, but still they have time to do some physical exercise. Still, they are really performing well in school. So they are avid players, they are watching online streams, but at the same time they are also practicing physical exercise, traditional sports, doing well in school. So esports and traditional sports seems not to be mutually exclusive. It is possible to combine these. Uh, and the importance and significance here as I see it, is that now when there is more and more of this organized training, teams, camps for youth who are interested in sports, that's kind of bringing a part of these avid players into that sort of organized training. And there they will get, at least in an ideal case, also uh, that sort of directions 
for physical exercise, directions to have enough rest, to have a healthy nutrition, all of that. There is a peer pressure when they are in a team to really kind of take into account all of these. So uh, that way, the esports activity may actually improve that sort of overall health in, in, in society, especially in this kind of vulnerable group of, of avid players. Uh, now we are currently in the process that there is a biannual survey in Finland uh, for more than 4,000 respondents, teenagers, about their physical exercise habits. And for the first time now this, this spring, there will be also questions about the playing gaming activity combat. So we will, we will have kind of data from more than 4,000 Finnish uh, teenagers uh, later this year about these, these issues. So uh, then we can kind of check if this uh, small pilot study is really reliable or not. Okay, so uh, now looking at the sea sports scene uh, more in general, so it's a this is kind of very important to, to realize that it's, it's highly diverse. It's, uh, it, it's so diverse that it's, it doesn't really make much sense to, to talk about these sports in general. Uh, we have different game genres. We have first person shooters, Counter Strike, Overwatch, Fortnite, this type of games. There are these uh, uh, mobile games like Dota, League of Legends, new strategy games, so on and so forth. Uh, very different games. Uh, then we have the, the kind of games which are based on, on uh, traditional sports like soccer, football, basketball. Uh, we have the racing games. Uh, and these are totally disconnected. If, if you are interested in some of these, uh, kind of, let's say, shooter games, you are necessarily not knowing anything what's happening in this kind of sport game. Or, uh, or what's happening in the simulated racing. So uh, totally different audiences. There are a little bit different uh, sort of uh, mechanisms how, how, the, how the field works. So you should take a more that sort of uh, precise look on, on kind of what type of esports you are looking at at a given time. Uh, so there are games like Hearthstone, which is basically a card game, farming simulator. Two weeks ago. Trim Hack Leipzig for the first time has farming simulator of tournament. So uh, there's no limit what can, can be turned into this course. We have single player, multiplayer, you know, mobile games. All of these have their own, own esports scene. A couple of, of uh, images. Uh, the first one is a Nordic championship in FIFA football game. Uh, Norway against Denmark. Uh, so uh, there was an audience, maybe 20 people watching this. Uh, there was prize money, 500 euros, I think, for the winner. Very nice uh, prize, I love that. But uh, so it's uh, not quite the same as then we have ESL1 in Dota 2. This was in Katowice a year ago. 8,000 people watching this, this tournament. Uh, quite different setting. Both esports, definitely. Uh, looking at the, at the economics of, the, of this uh, phenomenon, there are certain, certain characteristics. The uh, most significant thing is that the game companies who are producing the games own most of the major leagues and tournaments. So the game companies are really kind of dictating the rules. Uh, Blizzard, Steam, well, Steam is not, not really that sort of uh, anymore a uh, kind of game producer, but it's sort of platform. Uh, so they are, they are dictating rules, they are providing the officials. They are contributing most of the prize money, they finance many of the teams, so they are kind of meddling in all the levels. And for them, it's mainly promotional games. So it actually, the, the esports is a kind of byproduct of their, their kind of promotional advertising. Also, uh, the, the hardware manufacturers are deeply involved. Uh, so uh, Asus, 
Hewlett Packard, MSI, these are our big names in, uh, in sponsoring the events. And then what is important is that there is this betting company. So there is a huge betting scene related to, to esports. And that's, uh, of course, quite problematic in many ways. In many countries, betting gambling is uh, highly regulated, maybe totally prohibited. Uh, and also, uh, because much of the audience of esports are minors, uh, it, it's very hard to kind of follow that. Who, who is it? Or kind of, if, if they are not kind of involved in betting or not. And especially now that there is a thing called skin betting, where you are not using real money, but the, the virtual assets related to the games in the betting. Which is a great zone because they, are, they definitely have kind of monetary value, those, those digital assets. So it's, a, it, it's just a kind of way to, to uh, pass the uh, gambling uh, rules. But also the audience is donating to the casters. That sort of voluntary donations. And that's actually quite a big, big part of the, of the whole economics. And also, well, the, the international is known that it's the, it has the, the biggest prize pool. pool. It's uh, something like $25 million for the winner of the, of the tournament. And much of that money comes from the, from the, uh, kind of the, uh, the audience donations. But it's a very murky business. And when you go to, uh, well, this is from a winter assembly in Helsinki a year ago. Uh, there were two stages next to each other. One, um, there were Overwatch and uh, HP with its Omen brand main sponsor. And right next to that, Counter-Strike and, and, and there we Asus and the Republic of Gamers as the main sponsor. Uh, and it was quite an uh, exceptional case to have Overwatch, that sort of small tournament, because, uh, uh, the, because of the Overwatch League, uh, there is not, not much, uh, they are not allowing too many of these uh, kind of independent tournaments, but this was this an exception there. And then uh, uh, this is uh, ESL1 Delta 2 tournament. Uh, Jericho in Katowice, Mercedes-Benz as the main sponsor. The MVP of the tournament got a special prize, this very nice red Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> so just for the MVP, uh, so then there is the, the prize money for the winning team, of course. Uh, so there are <coughs> quite big money in the world, uh, but then there are also uh, areas which are not totally fully developed yet. There is merchandise available at the tournaments. But uh, as you see, the poor girl is uh, quite lonely there. Uh, not much of, of uh, business going on. So uh, in, a, in a traditional sport way, uh, you have the jerseys, you have all sorts of stuff there. But it's, it's not really that sort of happy yet. But, but, but it's kind of customary that you should have. Uh, the organizations which are, are involved. So there are these kind of big organizations which have several teams in, in different games. The Swedish uh, Ninjas in Pajamas, or the, the, again, the Swedish uh, Fanatic, these are kind of big organizations. There's Vitality, uh, G2, and, and several of those. Uh, well known if, if you are following um, sports, any of the games. Uh, there are professional teams uh, which are not kind of part of bigger organizations. Astralis. Danish team, uh, which has been dominating the Counter-Strike scene for a couple of years. NSA, Finnish Counter-Strike team, Virtus Pro, uh, Polish, and so on and so forth. But then it's also, there are lots of these traditional sport organizations, sports teams, uh, uh, franchises, which have started their own esports teams as well. So Paris Saint-Germain, FC Barcelona, for example, have their esports teams in, in various games. Uh, so uh, that, that's a that's a quite an, that's an interesting area. Uh, I've, I've been trying to kind of find out what these what these teams are really looking for here, and, uh, and main, mainly is that they are trying to kind of reach new audiences. That's the main motivation for this. But uh, they also uh, they are learning that esports is uh, 
is a different kind of field than the traditional sports, and, and there are all sorts of traps. Uh, and uh, some of the teams have, have kind of withdrawn. PSG, for example, doesn't have a rocket league team anymore. They have for several years, but uh, for some reason they, they quit. And then there are these licensed franchises, and, uh, and the Overwatch League is the, uh, the biggest of those. And it was, it was for the first season, it was more than 20 million dollars that can, you had to pay to, to uh, enter the league, and, and now it's uh, much more uh, expensive, so it's uh, also re requiring quite a lot of, of resources to, to enter that, that uh, uh, league. Uh, if you look at the, the significance of nas nationality in esports, uh, you might think that in, in, in video gaming it would not be nearly as important as, as in traditional sports. And to some extent that's true, but still, uh, I would say that the surprising amount, or the, that it's, it's, uh, it's surprisingly important. You, you will see that uh, when you go to these tournaments that uh, the, the teams are uh, emphasizing <coughs> where they are coming from. Many of the teams like Astralis and say, uh, Astralis, it's, it's, it's very obviously a Danish team. And say is almost like a national team of Finland in, in Counter-Strike. And in, in, in most cases in the team, the, all the players are of same nationality. They are using the national flag. They are identifying with the country where they are coming from. So that, that's the majority of the teams. But then there are some organizations which are not making that uh, big number. There may be players with mixed na nationality. Um, they're not using any flag, or they may be using like EU flag, like the mouse, mouse sports, uh, for example. So they have kind of players from various European countries. There are also city-based teams, like London Spitfire playing in uh, Overwatch <coughs> League. Helsinki Reds is a, a Helsinki-based uh, Counter-Strike team uh, connected to uh, local uh, ice hockey team. And what, what's happening very regularly is that the teams may change location, they may change owner, they may change names. That's happening all the time. And uh, a team may be bought from Australia and next year it's, it's playing in North America, for example. And also the player nationality is not tied to, to, the, to the organization nationality in, in many cases. Fanatic Swedish organization has a Dota 2 team which is fully Chinese, uh, playing mainly in Asia, but still part of the Swedish organization. Uh, and for the audience, uh, this again from the IEM Katowice, MIBR, uh, Brazilian Counter-Strike team playing there, they had their own very vocal supporting team traveling all the way from, from, from Brazil. Their in-game in leader, Fallen, was uh, taking selfies with their fans. There was one guy from the USA in the audience as well, making it down. Uh, but it, uh, it, it, quite clearly this is a kind of increasing tendency. It, it, it's, kind of, it's part of the sportification is that this uh, nationality is becoming even more important. So if you're looking at the audiences, so uh, the, the, the main way to follow esports is through these online streams. They, they, they all, that sort of the tournaments where you go to a physical arena, th these are exceptions. That's the, the most of the activity takes place online. So you, you're watching the streams, and the audience has usually kind of variety. They, they have selection. They, they can choose between the various streams. They can, they can choose different languages, and, and they can and choose between the caster or commentator personalities whom they happen to like this time. Uh, there's usually online chat available when you're following the stream, and that's, that's a huge part of the, of the whole experience. And also part of the, of the source of many of the, of the problems of the whole, whole thing. So uh, uh, there are kind of people are using memes, copy past that, that is uh, like there are these uh, text stream, uh, that's all streams that you are just copying into the chat, kind of spamming there. In the chat, there's very strong national overtones. It's often 
toxic, racist, misogynistic, whatever this goes in the chat. Uh, it's not that nice of them. So uh, often these kind of better choices are not cool in the chat at all. There are moderators, but the chat is taking place, so it's a fast pace. And, and there are always also a ways to kind of overcome the moderates and so on. That, that's one of the big, big problems. If, if in, a, in a football, for example, in a soccer, you have the, the, the sort of violence related to these uh, big games uh, as, as a big problem. In esports, I would say kind of this is the, the biggest problem there. But it's also playful communication. It's very creative. It's not all, all, all about this, this sort of toxic communication. So it's when you're watching a stream of, of Counter-Strike, for example, it, it looks something like this, and, and you have the chat there, it's going very fast, uh, and, and it's filled with all of these uh, memes, uh, and all of that, so it, 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 it's a, you really have to have kind of practice to be able to follow it to any extent. And uh, all of these memes have, have certain kind of connotations, uh, and uh, this uh, Pepe the Frog, for example, is connected to this uh, that sort of uh, out, uh, outright uh, racist uh, discourse to the extent that it's, uh, it's totally banned, so you're not allowed to use better the frog in the, in the Twitch chat at all. Uh, so, but you have to be kind of very well versed in the, in the practices to, to be able to kind of read all of the meanings of these memes. Uh, the Finnish team NSA became quite popular through the, through this, the memes and the copy pasta created by the fans. Uh, easy for NSA, Alucard, Alu is the, 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 kind of the most uh, famous player in the team. So people are just kind of repeating these, these memes. Uh, and they are Copying these these uh, kind of copy pasta texts in the chat, it's it's impossible to read them while 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 you're following the game because they're way too long. But they are actually, when you are, have a chance to really read them, they are that's sort of quite fun. They are some of them are almost poetic in quality. They are certainly kind of playful communication. Uh, so it's a uh, uh, well. Not going into detail, but so just to give you an idea. And uh, just through these, uh, uh, that sort of thing, the, the means, the creativity of the fans, NSA has, has gained that sort of uh, global fan base. And they are known for this, uh, the, the, the means. So we still continuing on the, on the, on the kind of audience practices. Uh, so uh, there, there's all sorts of fandom stuff, all, which is related to any other type of, of, of kind of popular culture. So people are, are creating fan art, fan fiction. They are engaging in cosplay, creating these memes, and all of this. Also, there is this uh, more that sort of, of uh, kind of uh, economical aspect to it. So they are, they are collecting these loot, loot boxes, which may have some monetary value. And, uh, kind of, so it's a, it's a huge area. Uh, in itself. A uh, few pictures from uh, <coughs> IEM Katowice, the, the cosplayers. There, uh, actually, these ones here are kind of professionals. They, they have been hired to be entertaining the audience. These are just kind of pure cos kind of fans doing their own cosplay during the event. Uh, and here, one of my kind of claims here is that if, if traditional sport is nowadays mainly media sport, then esports is transmedia sport. There is the game story, the, the fiction of the game, it's an integral element. And, and the, the, the fans are kind of extend, extending that fictional world of the game into the, the fan fiction, the fan art. Uh, in all of that user creative co uh, content. And also, there is a, well, the, it's the game itself, there are the various streams, uh, the player team, Twitter content, uh, 
the, the own playing of the game, that's part of the also of the experience. There, the cosplay, all of that, that creates this this that's a multifaceted transmedial uh, field. And and there, the the, the esports is a kind of it's a core there, but it's a, it's it's a, a surrounded by all these transmedial extensions. And uh, a couple of my, my students have been uh, conducting a survey uh, among the uh, Overwatch players and those who are following the Overwatch League, making questions related to this uh, media consumption. So they got more than 400 responses. Uh, and it, it, uh, it turned out that those uh, who are playing Overwatch themselves, they are kind of white avid consumers of, of all of this, this transmedia content, this kind of additional content as well. But those who are, are not that much playing themselves, but are just kind of following the, the Overwatch League, who are kind of closer to the kind of traditional sport audience, uh, they, are not so, they are not paying attention to all of these uh, uh, transmedia extensions. And uh, it turns out that the the game characters in Overwatch, they are these heroes, uh, and, and, and the player, the, kind of the player uh, personalities are uh, to some extent kind of versed or used. So, so, so the audience is uh, considering of kind of thinking them at, 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 at the same time, and it's a, uh, uh, that's a, it's a, the, the fictional character, the real player, are kind of hard to uh, to separate. Uh, it turned out also here that the player's nationality is important, so that's what the, what the audience is paying attention to. And also the gender and sexual orientation, both of the game character and the player, is, is important. And in Overwatch you have a kind of wide variety, also there are these non-human characters there as well. But it's uh, kind of, there is this, uh, the, the, the transmedia, especially for those who are playing they are also engaged in this uh, wider transmedia phenomenon. Uh, one more kind of dimension you can pay attention to, to in, in, in sports is this kind of the, the labor or, or a playful work that is uh, involved there. So these are the kind of playful forms of work emerging in the, in the digital culture. Uh, so of course there's the playing as a profession is for, for the professional players. But also there is the kind of streaming stuff, uh, but so there are these professional streamers as well. But there are many other esports related professions. There, there are coaches nowadays, uh, commentators, journalists, analysts, all of that. Uh, same type, some of them are quite similar to what, what we have in, in traditional sports. Uh, and then, of course, we can ask to what extent is this really playful. It is quite serious work for the players. But still, it, it's, it's combined play. There is still, to some extent, that sort of the playful play, play experience. Uh, but it's uh, the, the whole of the, that sort of play for it, 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 and the, the kind of making work more more playful. It, it may also be a kind of new demand, so that that you have to not, not just work, but you have to work and, and pretend that it's fun. <laughs> so is it? Is it is, is work called as in play? To, to, to what extent it's exploitation? These uh, contracts that the esport players are made to, to, to sign are often quite uh, awful. In some cases, the, the players have to kind of promise that they may be uh, uh, kind of re recorded 24-7 in case the game producer wants to at some point start a kind of reality type of TV show. So they don't have much choice. If they want to be in the game, they have to accept that sort of, of, of conditions. Uh, both the players have to go to this uh, signing events, meet the, the audience. Uh, Swedish uh, Olof Meister, one of the biggest Counter-Strike players of all time, making his Duty signing papers for the for the audience. There are some commentators of the things 
please watch our broadcast. Uh, gender roles. That's uh, that's kind of one of the one of the that sort of challenging points of the esports scene. Uh, if you compare to uh, to traditional sports, there is not really that sort of, of uh, demand for for having different or separate leagues, teams for female male players. There's not that, <coughs> that sort of the, the kind of physical difference there. But still. Uh, the gamer culture is, is kind of white, adolescent male, and this is this is very very much visible in, in relation to the female players. It's visible in the online chat. Uh, so uh, uh, it's 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 kind of very male dominated, and uh, there is a long way to go for the female players to to feel home in the esports scene. And does this what really need to replicate the structure of traditional sports? Why don't we have mixed teams, for example? There's, there's not really a kind of good reason for that, but, uh, but that's uh, just the case at the, at, the, at the moment. And just like in traditional sports, the price money for female teams is uh, just a fraction of the, the, the what's up, even to the male, male teams and tournaments. But uh, that's uh, that's something that uh, also I think kind of game education, game research has uh, something to contribute to this to, to try to make this more and more that's an equal field. And finally, coming from cultural studies background, we have to we have to raise social and kind of critical questions here. This is certainly kind of hege hegemonic practice. So there are these global Western companies which are which are ruling of the scene. Uh, at the moment there are whole continents which are pretty much missing from the map. There's no, they are not really that sort of recognized in the esports world. Uh, esports is something that started as a grassroots phenomenon. It's just that the avid players started these, uh, these tournaments on their own. But now it's uh, kind of taken over by the, by the companies and there's not much room for this kind of counterculture or resistance for this hege hegemonic practice. Uh, there has been some some kind of attempts to ban politics from esports arenas. Uh, the, well, many of the, the players in esports scene are kind of not really happy with this uh, kind of idea of, of going into the Olympics, for example, for kind of, sort of ideological reasons. Uh, it, it's a little bit the same like in snowboarding, for example. That they, for a long time, they were not really kind of wanting to, to get assimilated. Sort of mainstream sports. So it's not, it, it may be that the sport people themselves come and decide that they simply don't want, want to go to the, to the Olympics. The identity politics altogether, what is related to sports, it's, it's highly, highly concerned. Uh, and, and here is kind of one of the examples of this kind of politics and uh, the, the problematic relation here. It's that uh, last year when the Hong Kong protests were uh, at the peak. Uh, there was a, a Hearthstone tournament where uh, uh, the, the winner of the tournament uh, kind of made, made a in a kind of online stream uh, pro protesting or kind of, uh, pulled down his gas mask and, and called that liberate Hong Kong. And and Blizzard was quite harsh in, in here, so that this this player kind of he lost the the, the prize money. Two hundred thousand dollars, I think. So it was kind of considerable amount, but also got banned from a play for a whole year. And considering that he's a professional player, it's um, for a whole year not being able to, to kind of practice his work. That's a, that, that's really really that's a problem. So harsh a ban that uh, there are lots of protests. So the the audience, the other players, even people. In the Blizzard, the company started kind of protesting against this reaction, and uh, it, it got so uh, sort of heavy that the Blizzard had to had to kind of back down a bit. So uh, uh, they were, uh, I think, the ban was uh, kind of uh, reduced to much, much shorter and something else. So, uh, the audience still may somewhat influence this. So. Uh, 
some sort of conclusion of this uh, kind of overview of the field. Certainly, it's a professional scene there, but it, at least as importantly, it's also amateur practice, and we should not forget that. Uh, it, it, it's there as well. So it, it's at the same time, it's, it's labor, but it's also a hobby. Uh, and and that, that, that will be a tension that's, that's always there, and uh, you just have to kind of address it in, in various ways. Uh, there's certainly kind of sportification taking place, so it's borrowing more and more features of the traditional sports. Uh, well, and also it's, it's not necessarily antagonistic to physical exercise, which is often, often considered that esports players are just spending 16 hours a day playing these games. And if they are not <coughs> successful enough in the tournaments, they are rehearsing the game even more. That, that's not really true. Uh, it's, it's a global scene. Most of the tournaments are taking place on, on this kind of, kind of online, on, on, on global uh, stages. But there are very strong national emphasis. Uh, there's a toxic culture involved, but also at the same time, it's a challenge in binaries the gender, for example. Uh, there's lots of the creative, playful communication. So it's uh, it, that's a very, very uh, uh, tense uh, field. Uh, you have uh, these tendencies to, to, to various directions. And finally, as I see, it, what may be happening is that the esports, the, the uh, kind of developing of the field, is also uh, in a way taming and domesticating game. It's, uh, it's in a sen sense and regulating the field of game. It's it, it, through this sportification, through this professionalization of that and, and, uh, and this uh, very kind of strict regulation by the commercial companies involved. It, it's making it sort of uh, easier to accept and I'm kind of limiting the, many of the, of the aspects of, of, uh, game, of game. So that's all. Thank you. Pick up lights, maybe. We have time for some discussion. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions, comments. Sure. Yes. Thank you for the talk. I guess my question is about this relationship between sportification and labor. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there is a, like, for someone that has been following, like, esports, journalism, and, like, media coverage around, like, the topic, you get a lot of, like, on the other hand, on, on one hand, you see, like, this internet culture of streaming and those players developing their communities as streamers and pro players and having their own relationship with their audience and their in the game and, and on the other hand you have like these big companies putting those mostly kids on the spotlight and the process of sportification and you see those subjects kind of living double lives in a way that they have to be someone that appeals to streamer communities and they have their own like kind of relationship with each other and on the other hand you have like the, the burden of being broadcasted of signing big contracts of being sponsored by big <coughs> brands and dealing with these kind of different worlds coming together uh, and then you have cases as like XQC from the Overwatch League, for example, that he is a brilliant player, but like he couldn't, he wasn't able to live in that space of broadcast that a certain kind of behavior was expecting expected from him. So, uh, and this for me is something that is not just an isolated case. So I wonder how do you think about uh, this? different paths that sportification as in traditional sports and like this more internet meme stream culture can coexist in the e more broad esports uh, environment? Well, uh, that, that, that is a good question. Uh, no, no simple answer to that. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the, 
the, the game companies there are trying to limit that sort of the, 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 the other, other penalty in a way, the, the alternative. Uh, and, and also they have, they have means to do it. So, but, but at the same time, uh, I think that they are realizing that it's, it's, it's counterproductive. Uh, so it, it's a, uh, I, I, would, I would say that it, it, it's, a, it's still a kind of, that sort of useful for, for everybody to, to let the players to be that sort of oriented towards the streaming audience and, and those practices as well. Because it, even though it, it, it may be somewhat that sort of, of uh, d different direction than, than the sportification there, but it's, uh, it's uh, just, if, if you want to appeal that audience, uh, that's, that, that's the way. So, so I think eventually there has to be some sort of, of balance between those, those two. But it's, a, it's, a, it's just a so early phase in here that they, they have not, not really found the way to cope with it. Actually, uh, I have a question. Go ahead. Please, please. Um, question about transmedia. I really uh, uh, like to talk and enjoy it. So the term transmedia is interesting because when you think of watching regular sports, uh, the sports has an external reference because something is happening in three dimensions somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so in some ways, to me, that seems more like transmedia. But here, the, the medium is referring to itself. Uh, the more, I mean, when we watch on television any, any three-dimensional game, we don't, it might as well be fiction because we don't, we're not seeing the real players. Mm -hmm. So in here, um, also, but here the game itself has no three-dimensional aspect to it. It's not happening in, in space and time in that, you know, in that sense. Mm -hmm. So, it's, so, so I, I'm curious about your use of the term transmedia. Could you explain it? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it comes from, from, from this, actually, transmedia storytelling. Mm -hmm. Uh, Henry Jenkins. Uh, so uh, it, it's uh, the, the idea is that that, that you have the, um, the, there is a fictional world. Uh, there there are stories rising from the fictional world, and the stories are are distributed through through various media forms, mm -hmm. and the audience has to kind of <coughs> put together these bits and pieces, employing various media. So that that's a kind of very kind of specific way to to understand the kind of media. Uh, yeah, I just want to follow up on some of the, the questions around labor. Um, I, I know only enough about labor history as it relates to sports to know that it's really interesting and important. Uh, but uh, certainly in, in the case of the United States labor history, and I know that there was also one of the very first athletic labor unions was in Great Britain, I believe, for football, right around the turn of the 20th century. In all of the major sports in the United States, which I know better, the story of the unionization of the players is really interesting, right? Uh, and, and there's some shared sort of chapters and sequences that follow. So, so I, part of my question for you is, you know, do you anticipate uh, labor unionization uh, in esports? Uh, what obstacles to it would there be? I mean, I could anticipate certain things like, you know, National boundaries, it's always challenging to create labor unions beyond the national boundaries. But the other one that I think is interesting is to what extent does the emergence of this sport, this, as distinct from the conventional sports we have, it is a, uh, as a transmedia sport, it opens up so many opportunities for players to um, leverage their fame for their own private stream and other things they do. So at least the story that they have their own, they have plenty of their own opportunities. Mm -hmm to make a living, if you will, are, is there. So I'm just curious to hear some of your thoughts yeah, on that. Yeah. Well, well the, the unionization is, is happening already. They have the council strike, they have, they have the, the union there. Some sort of clutter, of course, they, they, are, they really don't have any power at the moment. It, it, it's more of a sort of, in, in principle, there, at, at least there is some sort of, of, of body there, somebody who is representing them. Uh, and, and in some other, some, some other other games as well, so 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 that that's taking place. But uh, uh, I would say that one of the problems or challenges there is that simply the players are so young, <laughs> the, the average, and many of them are under twenty. Uh, they don't really consider that that union aspect important at all. Also, uh, many of the players have the, the careers 
so short that they, they won't really kind of pay attention to that at that point. But, but it, it's, it's inevitable that there, will, there needs to be these <coughs> unions or, or some, something, something similar. But maybe, maybe it, it should be considered in a, in a more that sort of wider way that it's not only about the professional players, but it, it could also kind of cover the streamers, for example, or some, some other kind of actors, so, because they are so closely in this one. Yeah. So, uh, Thomas's point, one of the issues we've seen with esports and unionization is that the people setting up the unions for the professional leagues is the game developers who's running the professional league. So, with League of Legends and the American League, they hired a lawyer to run the Players Association, not the union. And so, we have all of these players who are being represented by someone hired by Riot Games <laughs> to lobby Riot Games for things that the players want. And I think that's probably the problem, or at least one of many problems when it comes to having 18-year-olds trying to unionize. It's not coming from them. Uh, it's being forced upon them, but not in terms that they understand. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing sort of in the immediacy uh, and in the collapse of that sort of players association. And, and the vertical integration of, the, of each sport itself as an architected software object. It's not an analog, you know, except for maybe some cases. It's, it doesn't exist except in as much as that same company produces and provides it, whereas any kids can go play basketball or soccer or you know, formal league, presumably. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good question? Yeah. Yeah, go. Um, so I appreciate that you're calling attention to uh, the kind of toxic right-wing discourse and the other political problems that we see in esports, and I recognize that those are problems that are endemic, of course, in our society, and certainly endemic in online, you know, in online forums. Um, but I'm, I guess I'm troubled by the kind of, yeah, well, there, we have this here, but there's also like, you know, some playful stuff, and, mm -hmm. you know, and they're exercising, um, you know, I mean, Hitler Youth, <laughs> and and what I what interests me in thinking about this is the you know I'd be interested in you know not so you but that's having to do this but in people to think more about the way in which the structure of esports and I'm thinking in particular the kind of stream that goes by that is as you say unfollowable but is like this, often this stream of foulness that is acceptable. And how that stream parallels, for example, the techniques being used by the Trump campaign and other sort of right-wing um, political campaigns of flooding the internet with uh, bots and memes and other things that on Twitter that just go by also so quickly that you can't possibly see them. And so I'm interested in whether there are um, significant connections between a certain kind of reactionary right-wing uh, toxic politics and a, a forum in which content and meaning is subordinated to the kind of constant stream of affective force and so forth, because I think that's one of the things we are seeing not, and this is where esports are not unique, one of the things we are seeing in our online world these days is this kind of flow of toxicity that isn't followable and capturable necessarily, but that has a kind of affective force, at the very least of normalizing and regularizing this is, yeah, okay, it's fine, that's, you know, yeah, but that's not really the real. So I don't know if you know work that's looking at any of this or if any students are just that. Well, kind of question. Not, not really. Not really. Oh, but, uh, well, T.L. Taylor and Key. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, for, for the rest of the room, if you don't know, um, th th there are people very much interested in addressing this problem. Um, and yeah, question? Oh, uh, I was not awake, so I 
Uh, yeah, well, just, just to <laughs> quickly, so, so kind of in general, kind of the, the, the toxic culture in esports. So, so that's a there, there's lots of research on that. Yeah, yeah, but not necessarily on that kind of specific way that, yeah. that you can yeah. train. Okay, so so why why do you think? I'm just going to play off of your question a little bit. Why do you think that? The, the streaming slash internet culture has that kind of dynamism where it's super creative and super playful. Because when you when you post it, when you show those copy possible, it was like some of them are hilarious. Those are some of the stuff I've seen, like some of the stuff I've read on the internet. Like why do you think that it, it, it's really just two 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 poles on the spectrum where it's like it can be this super right wing, this super you don't want to read anything about it, but at the same time, it can be so creative, so funny, and so like so thought provoking too. Why do you think? And in ways, do you see this as a counterculture? Do you see this as in many ways resistance to kind of it's it's being absorbed? Like how you were saying, like is it being tamed? Is these boys being tamed? Is it being absorbed by the imagenic? Uh, yeah, well, I, I would say that. So uh, the, 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 the companies, the, the, the whole of this, that sort of the commercial structure there is kind of taming and regulating it to the extent that the, the, the chat is one of the, the kind of rare places where the, uh, that sort of, uh, uh, some sort of resistance uh, still ha has, a, has a place and, and that's, that's, that's where the kind of toxicity uh, then, then finds, finds its uh, that sort of form. But it's, uh, 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 it, it's kind of increasingly addressed by the uh, by these uh, organizations, but I, I, I'm not, I, I was not trying to make it as a that sort of, of uh, uh, binary, so that, that that you have the the, the toxic outright whatever, and and then that sort of cre creative and. and uh, 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 artistic expression of the other other end, but they are not kind of uh, mutually I, I, don't, I, I don't mean like they are mutually exclusive. Like two things can be yeah. right at the same time. But, uh, so uh, I, th I think, think that's and you are getting to this. It's you know the, the fundamental challenge that these media forms bring to us, which is they're really complicated. You know, and there's some really ugly stuff. And as Richard suggests, they can be exploited in ways that are really sinister. But at the same time, there's all this stuff going on, and it's not necessarily all sinister. I and mean, it's like you said, yeah, the copy pasta stuff is sometimes a blast. But, uh, so, but it's all together. So I was thinking, too, about the relationship between the creativity and this kind of toxicity, let's say. And one of the questions I was asking, and I'm not necessarily asserting this as true, but it's a question, is whether this certain kind of playfulness, a kind of virtuosity, let's say, doesn't, isn't connected in some way with a culture of individualism and a culture of individual sort of, well, let's just say individualism as opposed to a culture of collectivity or collaboration that is often connected to that kind of culture of individualism with some uh, well, history of, let's say, oppressive behavior. And I don't know that I'm asserting that, but I was just wondering, you know, there's other ways to be creative, and there's a certain kind of virtuosic creativity that we have recognized, but there's creativity of sharing, and creativity of collaborating, and creativity of cooperating and not competing. And, and this, again, is not unique to esports when you get into the competitive realm. Of course, it's about virtual. Um, I don't know. It's a, I think that's another interesting. <laughs> well, at, at the same time, so it, it, it's about memes, which is, I would say, that's sort of an antithesis to, to individualism in the, in the sense that it's sort of, of copying at infinitum. So. Collectivity of memes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I mentioned T.L. Taylor earlier. I, I would also throw on the virtual syllabus um, Stephanie Pollock and, and Patrick from the yeah, yeah. metagaming because that, that does come to some of the things that we have. Sorry. 
Sorry, that's behind yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, this is making me think about an earlier kind of transmedial thing that was sometimes compared to sport in ways that satisfied nobody. It was not really sport, but pretended to be, which was professional wrestling. And not digital, but it you know it has the same kind of transmedial sprawl. Is it theater? Is it religious ritual? Is it nationalist propaganda? Is it uh, is it athletics? Right? And in my childhood, it was very big. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what it looked like was the chat stream on the side. Somebody would come out dressed like a cartoon Arab, and twenty thousand white people would scream racist invectives at them. Right? And then there would be a kind of purifying pageant of violence <laughs> over contaminating one. And you know, then this the cycle would kind of repeat again. So all all non-digital, but it, uh, I was just thinking in here, my dissatisfaction with the sport part of these sports, which it seems to me ideologically legitimizing in ways that I'm not content with, maybe professional wrestling or something like that is must be I'm 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 not too familiar with that, that, <laughs> that tradition, so I can't really say. But <laughs> just, just thinking it as transmedia, in the kind of transmedia storytelling sense, then if there is, if there is that sort of the, these other, other fictional extensions, if, if there are comics based on the wrestling characters, uh, uh, maybe TV shows and, and, and that sort of things, then, then it would really count as I transmedia. I would remind you that we were looking at one last night. <laughs> That's, that's doing the right. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Okay. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it's transmitted. So, 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 and oh, maybe it's, it's, it's has influenced this what seems as well. Uh, Leah. Oh, yeah. So my question uh, is on um, playlists. So I hear, I don't know really much about the conversation about esports, but I, but I hear this thrown around a lot with the. Um, uh, modification or sportification or monetization of play somehow makes it less playful, like less playful, but the playful leaves because it's a performance of, as opposed to some sort of like real playfulness. But I would say like there are lots of spaces in which playfulness is modified or monetized, like in theater or in movies or in comedy, and I wouldn't consider any of those less playful because they get money for it. And in any time you're acting playful, you're always creating playfulness in the audience as well. And so I'm, I'm just, I was wondering if you could like, um, just talk a little bit more about what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well yeah, certainly it's, uh, that there are kind of senses to, to, to playfulness, but if it's, uh, there has to be some sort of, of uh, spontaneity and, and freedom. And and uh, voluntary, voluntary, so that, that this sort of aspect which are diminished when it's it's made into into a profession. So I, I don't think it's a, it's it's so much that there is no no place for play playfulness at all, but it's a, it's a kind of relative meaning is is, uh, is uh, diminished there, uh, maybe 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 that way. Also, uh, in, in well, that sort of. Uh, not necessarily place that much for for, for that of creating solutions. Uh, there, there is when there is too much at stake, then then you, you just don't dare to be that that creative to, 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 that that playful. And then you just have to try to kind of make the, the, the certain level of performance. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah. know of any work or have you noticed how uh, people get introduced to spectatorship in esports? So for example, like with analog sports, you'll go to a baseball game with a family member or something like that. But like when it comes to esports, it's quite different. There's, you know, yes, there's tournaments that you could attend in person, but I'm not sure if there's any work out there like that that you know of. Yeah. Well, there, there is a there is a well, of course, TLT has been mentioned several times. But there are there are others as well. But but it's a it is a quite challenging field. So that uh, how how to, how to reach the online audience, and so so far it's 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 either looking at the chat and and kind of that way trying to to understand what's happening with the audience, or then going to these uh, kind of land events and, and interviewing or, or observing people there. 
but uh, uh, it, it's just a kind of one fraction of the, of the, of the old field. So there, there's certainly a kind of need, much need for, for the kind of research on, on that field. Yeah. Well, there are some people who might even work by kind of doing that work, of course. Uh, I was uh, uh, struck by you, you were uh, kind of characterizing the, um, the players as being uh, mostly mostly male, mostly white, right? mm -hmm. and um, and it strikes me that there's a I mean there's an active East Asian esports culture. Oh, yeah. and, I wonder, and I wonder does that mean that they don't compete together with eight, with European leagues or they don't win or it, it strikes me as one one of the things that's interesting about esports is as opposed to real sports, is that you don't have to have co-presence to, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, maybe you still have a language barrier, but you don't have, you don't have to have, there's no, they don't have this barrier of co-presence co to, um, to keep. And so I wonder, you know, what, what, um, what is it that makes a, a, a white dominant sport? Mm -hmm. uh, well, well that, that, that's certainly true that it's, uh, that there is a, uh, what, what, what a big portion of the players' teams are, are Asian, really. so, so, uh, not, not only only white, uh, and uh, well, actually there are limitations to that. So that, that, that in, in many games, the, the North American teams are not allowed to have more than certain percentage of, of Asian players. There, there are several teams which are kind of full, fully fully kind of Asian Asian players there, but uh, kind of trying to, to to avoid that. So they are they are certainly kind of. Competing together, uh, they are playing in, in the same same uh, tournaments. But but at the same time, most of the of these kind of the bigger tournaments are are divided, that's so geographically, so that most of the most of the <coughs> games take place within certain certain area or, or, or continent. And it, it's only in these these final stages that that you have have the uh, that's a, a, a mix of you know, various various teams. But uh, yeah, I, I guess it's uh, it, it, it's mainly kind of connected to that the, the, the most of the of the game companies which are producing game, games around which the sports is, is emerging are are these uh, kind of uh, North American European uh, companies. And so is Twitch. Twitch is yeah. North American and European. Like East Asia has thousands of other streaming platforms that they consume content on. And Twitch has no penetration in that market. Yeah, and so and, and also yeah, there is a, that sort of or limited penetration. Yeah. They, they, they have their own own, own scenes, in South Korea for for example. So they don't necessarily have to kind of go into the international. They have big enough there. Yes, uh, Mr. Kirk, if we could like just go back a little bit, should the I, following up on Thomas' point of. Uh, players unionizing and labor. Uh, how do you see regulation in that, like regulatory moves, like government or associations trying to make things more bearable? Because at the same time that we have like, I mean, I, I feel that at some point we are looking towards like the one percent of players, like the top of the pyramid, those that are like so successful and they have like success stories, but we. Maybe I'm not looking as clear uh, or as close as those players that are suffering from burnout syndrome, or they're having anxiety problems, or they're developing a series of like other disorders due to the stress of like streaming. I don't know, like 12 hours a day to try to build their community and try to like make it, uh, just like make it at some point. Um, and I'm asking this because, like, in Brazil, we're having a very intense discussion about regulation, about how <coughs> teams and companies uh, are supposed to behave in relationship to their players and what kind of responsibilities they have towards that those players. And it's a, it's a pretty uh, difficult debate to have because, as Thomas said, we have, like, those companies are, it's vertical, so they own everything, like the infrastructure, they could like just erase the game and that's it, that's over. So I wonder how our guys in Northern Europe are looking or talking about regulation or some kind of governance. Well, 
I have to say that there, there is not much talk on that yet. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's not um, big enough in, in, in many ways. That there are, it's uh, it, it's uh, such a small amount of the, especially the professional player. Uh, so we, we don't really have that, that, that much at, at the moment. There is maybe a little bit of sense that it's, uh, it's kind of, there are no tools to, to really make anything because it's, uh, it's this that's a global or, or kind of companies outside of Finland, Sweden, whatever, Denmark, so that, that we don't really have uh, a reach to them. So, but uh, uh, I, 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 I guess that it's, it's just kind of beginning that, that there will be definitely some sort of problem. And, and, and in Europe, I, I hope that it will be on an EU level that there will be some sort of guidelines and, and the kind of policies for, for, for regulation. That's the only way I can see that it can take place. Sure. To kind of bind the parents that are previous to this one, I think that like a, an interesting case study country to look at would be Japan. Because Japan has, because of their history with I think specifically the Yakuza have extremely strict gambling laws. So much so that esports, even though Japan obviously is the home of video game, a lot of video game culture, um, had had no esports present in the way that we understand in terms of like playing for money and stuff, because of the gambling laws. It was considered gambling to like you know put down five dollars on a Street Fighter game, right, or to enter a tournament with monetary winnings. And so that's a good example of where like the, the regulations of a government can really hamper the potential growth of an esports scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Japan is certainly well. Well, of course, Japan and South Korea both are those that that's, uh, maybe have to be most good that sort of developed fields and then that, that's where we kind of try to look for, for some, some guidelines. And, and a number of these sports we're already seeing the uh, beginnings of fantasy teams. That mm -hmm. your own players, right? It creates an enormous opportunity for uh, mostly localized betting, but also mm -hmm. uh, much more systemic betting. You know. It's almost meta fantasy. If you're yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think too much about it. But <laughs> <laughs> also, the, the betting companies are arranging their own tournaments. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm going to show you as well. So, I do get the impression that this thing has exploded, you know, over well, however many decades, but, you know, it seems to have suddenly gotten much more intense. And it's happening in various, you know, kind of regional contexts that I think as scholars we don't necessarily have our hands around. So the question I wanted to ask is, is there any community of scholars that, you know, is attending to East Asia, Japan, you know, Korea? I mean. Is there, you know, DIGRA? I mean, who? Where do people come together and talk about this? Uh, well, DIGRA is one of the, 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 the South Game Research Association, Association yeah. uh, conferences. Uh, uh, Esports is, is one of the teams there, but it's, it's, it doesn't figure that, that heavily. There are certain kind of new, new conferences emerging. Uh, ESC, uh, Esports Research Conference, which, which took place in, in Irvine. Uh, last fall, uh, I was I was in, in Sweden, in Jönköping, just a couple of months ago, where there's a esports research network was just starting, uh, mainly European one. So there are these new forums, but they are in a, in a very sort of early phase. Maybe one last question, if anyone has one. <coughs> Otherwise, we can see you upstairs. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.